If you are looking for a compelling book by a Toronto author, look no further than What Disturbs Our Blood. It's part social history of Canada, a family memoir, and a personal quest. I welcome James Fitzgerald, the author to the show. Hi, James. Hi. I'm so glad that you're here today to talk about this book. Mm -hmm. It's certainly a lot of buzz about it being one of the best of the year. Can you briefly introduce us to the characters who are your family members? Sure. Um, that's me on the cover, age three. <laughs> Um, with my furrowed expression, I'm sort of the little detective because I would call my book a self-murder mystery. I, I grew up in my grandfather's house in Toronto. Uh, I knew nothing about him. All I knew as I grew up eventually was that he was a very eminent doctor. Mm -hmm. As I, in my teens, I watched my father, who grew up in the same house, slowly unravel. Nervous breakdown, gradually suicide attempts, and I'm starting to piece together in my own teenage mind, my, what about my grandfather? Why is no one talking about this man? Silence. And so one day I asked my mother point blank, did my grandfather kill himself? And she simply nodded. And there was no other information. And that was the end of the story at that it, moment. At that point, so my 20s and 30s. And then I, I, it's, it's kind of haunted me, this story. I'm the eldest son of an eldest son of an eldest mm -hmm, son. And mm -hmm. so I'm thinking, uh-oh. And I, I became a journalist and uh, did a, a book. And this thing kind of revisited me in my dreams. I have very powerful dreams about my grandfather. And uh, that kind of opened me up to, to begin the journey. And uh, I went into archives. And I was astonished to discover <laughs> who my grandfather was. I mean, I'm in the same family. And I didn't know his achievements. And most Canadians don't really appreciate that this man was a pioneer of public health in Canada. Is considered was called public, Canada's public health visionary. Well, tell us a little bit more about him, because yeah. in addition to being the story of how it is that you know he became somewhat forgotten from the Canadian historical yes. record, yeah. it's fascinating to go through one's own family history to learn about where we came from. Yeah, absolutely. Who is Gerald Fitzgerald to those who don't know him? Yeah, he uh, he founded the Connaught Laboratories around World War One, and what is astonishing about the story is that. Um, within a single generation, he sort of single-handedly moved Canada from a backwater. Mm -hmm. Like our, our public health system was in chaos and infectious diseases killing children, you know, diphtheria, terrible disease. It was rampant. Thousands of kids choking to death, essentially, and, and parents being helpless. And uh, diabetes, of course, just killed people. And, and uh, the, the lab, uh, the first big event of the lab a historical accident was Banting and Best mm -hmm. discover insulin in 1922 and my grandfather was intimately involved with that and so he's mass producing insulin the, the lab is only seven years old and it's a rockets up and gets international attention and uh, that was only sort of one feather in the cap mm -hmm. then he sets about systematically eradicating diphtheria um, it, but it's all Canadian thinking and Canadian innovation was outstripping the Americans and the British. Well, the rest of the world. They came to Toronto to train. He started training international public health doctors from all over the world. And, and the Rockefellers poured money in mm -hmm. to the uh, School of Hygiene and the Connaught Labs. And so within a generation, as I say, uh, it, was, it was a remarkable transformation. So this, this coincided, this brilliance and this drive coincided when at the peak of his success in his 50s, he suddenly starts to crack up, mm -hmm. my grandfather. And again, I knew nothing of this. And I was able to, through interviews and archival searchings, and my mother was quite helpful. She said, you should interview that doctor who's in his 90s, and he knew your grandfather. And uh, then the turning point came in 1995 when I walked into the CAMH archives, the, the former 999 Queen Street Asylum, right? I know it and my is. grandfather had worked there as a psychiatrist before he went into public health. And I, it's a remarkable coincidence. I walk in, and that very week, 60 letters had been donated by the widow of a psychiatrist who had kept them for 50 years. And they are written by my grandfather in the last year of his life. And these letters are unbelievably powerful. And I, when I saw the letters, I realized I had a book. Because he keeps obsessively repeating in the letters, I have committed the unpardonable sin, and the penalty is death. So you, I'm going, whoa. <laughs> so I lead the reader along the path that I went on to find out, so what is this unpardonable sin? Like, and why would he destroy himself? A man who had the world by the tail, all this international reputation, love of his peers, remarkable man, you know, sense of humor. and, and uh, So uh, I'm not going to tell you what happened. <laughs> no, don't spoil 
spoil it for those who are already uh, literally on the edge of their seat, myself included. But you also talk about the personal excavation of your father's story as well. Can that's right. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, that's where it was spooky, was the the repetition of their stories and, and how they were treated by the psychiatric profession. That's part of the story that's very disturbing, is mm -hmm. because there's doctors among doctors, and no one's sort of asking the obvious questions, and, and, and there was no talk therapy. They didn't really have a chance to talk out their problems, mm -hmm. both of them. So the 1930s and the 1960s, it was kind of a replay. And I got all of their files, and I was able to see this remarkable kind of uh, duplication. So they both received shock. And my grandfather, by a supreme irony, received insulin shock which was a new, exper new experimental treatment in the late 30s. For something he was pioneering. He, he had mass-produced insulin hands. for the masses. So they, he was a guinea pig, and he had 57 of them were brutal. I have all the files on it. And he would go into comas and sweats and convulsions. And if you've seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, mm -hmm. there's a depiction of it there. And it's, it was discredited later, but it, was, it essentially drove him in, deeper into his despair. He killed himself after he got out of the asylum. And, uh, you certainly reveal a lot of dark truths about Canada's medical system at that time. Yes. But you're also talking about very personal family truths. Can you mm -hmm. tell us, as a writer of your own story, what that process feels like to share such personal marrow of your family stuff? It's suffering? incredibly liberating. I mean, I think when I found those letters, you know, that was the, the first step. Um, but I didn't find out the nature of the suicide until much later. And so I interviewed this doctor. Uh, so, sometime after I found the letters. It was sheer luck. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't found him, I wouldn't have found out. And when I found out this sort of shocking revelation, I, I understood why my father was so silent About. and why I grew up in silence. Mm -hmm. And I understood why the medical profession was silent. It makes sense to me now. And I had actually been dreaming and intuiting as this, this, this child on the cover. Mm -hmm. Kids pick up. Kids have radar. They know when people are ignoring something, they pick it up. I wasn't extraordinary that way. I was just a kid. But I think I just follow that thread in my writing all the way through the story. I bring the reader along, like, follow your intuitions. You're usually right. You know? Well, you're uh, speaking to a lot of people who've had that experience of a family secret that is suppressed, but they know there is something there. That's right. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but that simply has whetted the appetite of those watching to read this fantastic book. For more information, jamesfitzgerald.info. And what disturbs the blood, I tell you. It's fantastic summer reading. It's actually great reading all year long. When we come back, Drew is in the kitchen cooking with Milagro Restaurant, and I'm going to sneak a few more peeks at Chapter <laughs>